Hi, I'm Isabel. You know me. You've seen this before, probably. If you haven't, hi, welcome. Consider subscribing. Yeah, we were instructed in one of my classes to make a video essay. And so I took about a month to work on that instead of the one that I was working on for this thing, which is a hobby. And it's taking a while. It's a big thing. It'll be fun. I'm excited. Uh, but y'all might be starving for content. You're probably not. You probably have other people that you watch. But, you know, I figure. I have it. It's ready. It's done. Fully done. And I may as well present it to the internet. It's about transphobia. Don't be transphobic in the comments. Not the topic I plan to cover extensively past this, but it's interesting. This video contains discussions of transphobia, suicide, drugs, police brutality, and capitalism. Proceed with this in mind. Hi, I'm Isabel Strauss Riggs, and in case it's not immediately obvious, I am transgender. Because of this, I face a not insignificant amount of marginalization, both as part of the collective queer community and personally. I am not here to argue the validity of my identity. If you want me to do that, you're absolutely free to pay me. Uh, I'm here to talk about the oppression and the two main aspects of it, the social and the economic. The social aspect is a lot of what is often thought of as oppression, a higher risk of suicide, bullying, police brutality, etc. But the economic part is very important and perhaps more impactful to the lives of marginalized people. The two sides are not as separate as I just described, and as a matter of fact, solving the economic side would go a long way towards lessening or even eliminating many of the social aspects. Let's examine a few forms of economic oppression and see how fixing them would help alleviate some of the social oppression along the way. A quick disclaimer on data. The majority of my data is from a 2015 study conducted by the National Center for Transgender Equality, along with another survey done by the Movement Advanced Project and Center for American Progress in 2015. Where possible, I have compared this data with the 2020 U.S. Census, which was the first to include any meaningful data on transgender and LGBTQ people. However, at time of writing, at least, the full report on that census is not out as far as I could find. Uh, overall, the data that I was able to find shows either similar or even greater disparities between transgender people and the greater population. It's also worth noting that the oppression faced by transgender people of color is even worse due to the intersection of those two marginalized identities. With that said, part the first, employment discrimination. The most obviously economic form of oppression would be employment discrimination, which transgender people most definitely face. We have an unemployment rate that is three times higher than the general population's, and 16% of respondents reported having lost their jobs due to their gender presentation. Nearly one-third are in poverty, and over 80% have faced some form of discrimination at work. For three-quarters of that 80%, the discrimination reached the point of forcing them to either delay their transition or quit their job. After leaving a respectable job, they often resort to illegal forms of labor, such as sex work and drug dealing. One in five respondents have taken part in the underground economy at some point in their life. Due to this, many of them had interactions with the police, where the vast majority of them were harassed or assaulted. For nearly half of those arrested, carrying condoms was used as proof of illegal activity. Transgender people face oppression, which forces them out of respectable, 
jobs, and they are then forced to turn the jobs that give police ample opportunity to arrest them. Once arrested, employers have even more reason to deny them regular jobs. And if convicted of a felony in most states, they can no longer vote, are ineligible for food stamps, and are often considered prohibitively risky candidates for rentals or mortgages. Second part, housing discrimination. So, if a lack of secure employment affects transgender people's ability to attain secure housing, how much does that really matter? Well, only 16% of transgender people own their own home, and nearly one-third have been homeless. For reference, nearly two-thirds of the general population are currently homeowners. So that's a pretty large percentage who have been homeless. That's the easiest, like, bad statistic to point to. But also, it's worth considering the first statistic, right? Trans people are nearly four times as likely to rent compared with the rest of the population. This means that they are unable to build generational wealth in the form of real estate. But let's go back to homelessness, because believe it or not, there's even more to that particular flavor of discrimination. Of that 30% of trans people who have been homeless, nearly a quarter of them have avoided shelters due to a fear of mistreatment, and 4% were fully denied entry to a shelter due to their gender. Even when they were comfortable enough to seek help, the vast majority of their experiences prove that 26% to be correct. An overwhelming 70% were mistreated due to their gender, over half were assaulted or harassed, either sexually, physically, or verbally. As a result of this and other discrimination, such as being forced to present as the gender they were assigned at birth in order to receive services of the shelter, 44% uh, left. They preferred to fend for themselves on the streets. Being homeless is nearly always caused by economic hardship, which, as we established earlier, transgender people definitely face. Being homeless undoubtedly has social challenges as well as the economic ones. Especially with limited access to shelters, basic hygiene is often hard to attain. Transport is nearly impossible unless you happen to live in a big city such as DC. It is hard to keep a hold of belongings, and even harder to keep the ones that you have in good condition. All of these things together can make it hard to get a job, access public services without harassment, and even get basic healthcare services. Oh, that made a difference. Part 3. Healthcare Discrimination In the United States of America, the cost for even the most basic doctor's appointment can be as high as $200. To cover that and more extensive things, a vast majority of Americans have health insurance. Transgender people often require gender-affirming health care that greatly reduces our risk of suicide and mental health problems. This necessary health care makes it possible for trans people to sometimes avoid a portion of the public discrimination by passing to the average cisgender person, although that is not the goal of being trans. It can also make them feel like they belong in their own body. This healthcare can take many forms. From hormone replacement therapy to gender reassignment surgery, surgery without insurance can cost as much as $10,000 and sometimes more. Hormones can be thousands. Even with insurance, we are talking about hundreds of dollars for the ability to live life as yourself. But not every trans person has insurance or is able to access it. When seeking gender-affirming care, one in four had a problem with their insurance, and one-third had a discriminatory experience with their healthcare provider. But that only accounts for the people who are able to get healthcare at all, right? Nearly a quarter of trans people avoided it because of discrimination and a third avoided it due to the cost. Please refer back to our employment section to determine why that may have been a factor. Even seeking medical care is no guarantee that you'll receive it, uh, particularly for gender-affirming care. Insurance companies make trans people jump through endless hoops to receive life-saving care, making it 
you know, more and more and more expensive. This economic struggle also bleeds into the social. Trans people are nearly eight times as likely to experience serious psychological distress and ten times more likely to attempt suicide than the general population. Even once someone has transitioned, they're not fully in the clear. Uh, 8% of transgender people have detransitioned, although less than half of that was permanent. Nearly 50% of those people cited economic reasons for doing so. For many people, transitioning involves a social aspect and a medical one. Both of these are expensive to start. You can spend hundreds on a new wardrobe, and changing your name is not cheap. But to maintain the medical part, I mean, if you're lucky, you'll have good insurance and a low copay. But if not, it could be thousands spent on surgery and hormones. Hormones you need to pay for monthly. You need time off of work to recover for surgery, often weeks or a month. But regardless of those reasons, of all those who ultimately chose to detransition, less than 10% said that they wanted to. Final portion. So what do? Hopefully by this point, you realize that the social aspects of marginalization are intrinsically linked to the economic ones. In order to solve one, we must solve the other. So what can normal people do? A lot of this is very cliche, but truly, call your representatives, uh, vote for people who would help trans people, fight for the Equality Act for free health care. At the time of writing, there are 130 bills in state governments aiming to harm trans people. Many of them are directed at trans children. Protest them. There was a variant of the Don't Say Gay Bill in Maryland. It's since been defeated, but just because you're in a blue state doesn't mean the discrimination can never touch you, right? On a more personal level, there are some easy things you can do. Make any space that you have power over a welcoming one. Respect names and pronouns. Whenever you can, step in to defuse harmful situations when you see them. Teach yourself about trans history and trans people. Uh, most of all, Listen to us. Ask what would help your trans friends. Do it. Be supportive. Thank you very much for watching.